A few years ago, I woke up in a mathematics lecture. To the left of me, my friend still had her head firmly planted on the desk in front. And to my right, a body stirred. And a student murmured, is this still microbiology? <laughs> Now, situations like this are not that unusual, unfortunately. Evidence suggests that many of our common teaching and learning practices across both Eastern and Western universities are at best suboptimal, in many cases ineffective, and on occasion, a complete waste of time. One student, a UK student, told me earlier this month that his lecturer started their session that day by saying, now let's be honest, none of us want to be here. <laughs> and yet, and yet, universities are staffed by staff who go out to do a really good job and attended by students who go out intending to learn. Something systemic is getting in the way of optimal teaching and learning and culture in our universities. Now, it would be foolish and patently untrue to suggest that there aren't many, many strengths to universities. They go on to lead to change many aspects of society in our world. But precisely because they're so important means we shouldn't rest with where we are. There is room to change, and there is significant need for us to change. Let me tell you a story. Last year, I was on a tour of Chinese universities. And I went to one in northern China, and I arrived, and I saw that the classroom I was due to speak in looked something like this. All very well. And I thought, well, that's great if I was going to give a lecture for hours after hour. But the evidence shows that lecture teaching, stand and deliver teaching, is not the best way to educate, to develop adults and students at universities. Scott Freeman and his group at the University of Washington published in 2014 the largest ever meta-study, analyzing 200 studies, comparing traditional lecture teaching to active learning. Active learning being discussion-based, problem-based, interdisciplinary. And they found overwhelming evidence overwhelming evidence that active learning techniques are far more effective than traditional lecture-based courses. One and a half times more students fail in traditional lecture-based courses, even in engineering, maths, and the hard sciences, than in these active learning ones. And so when I arrived in this university, I said, well, I don't want to be the sage on the stage, even though that has its place sometimes, including, I, I hope, today. Let's have the classroom set up for active learning, like a primary school classroom. And they turned around and they said to me, but this is what our primary school classrooms look like. <laughs> the problem is even greater in Eastern universities than it is in Western ones. We need to recapture what Bob McKim from Stanford and others say about the joy, the curiosity that is natural and intrinsic in our children, the ability to go out to critically question, to challenge, We need to bring that into our adult learning lives, not because it's more fun, but actually because that makes it more effective. And the evidence backs that up. And this is not a new quest. Ever since the time of Greek philosophers, you see Aristotle in his tome on rhetoric talking about the emotional experience of communication and learning and how that's vital alongside logic and the other components. You see Socrates, who gave us a Socratic method, this idea of questioning and probing through early modern universities in Bologna, Paris, Oxford in the 11th century, the rise of scholasticism, this idea of stand and deliver, pause, reflect, question, discuss, collaborate before concluding. Is that prevalent in our universities today? I suggest not as much as it should be. Just because straight lecturing is easier, just because lecturing is how lecturers have been taught, just because the word lecture is even in the title lecturer, doesn't mean that the evidence supports that that's the best culture for teaching and learning in universities. And this is important, because universities are important. A huge number 
of the most influential adults in the world have been sculpted, developed, schooled, molded by our universities. We need to get them right, and there is a better way. I'm calling it the human-centered university. Taking these principles from ancient times, things that are central to our humanity, and placing them yet again at the center of our universities. Their cultural expression will be that of the 21st century, but the principles are just the same. Let me run them through uh, with you, and then we'll look at some practicalities. The first one is this, interdependence. When we start our lives as a baby, we start in a place of dependency, with someone else meeting our every need. And many of us end our lives in exactly the same way. One of the stated aims of many universities is to bring their students to a place of independence, a place where they have initiative, the ability to learn to go on and work for themselves. But I argue there's a higher value, that of interdependence that of taking the best of my strengths, combined with the best of your strengths, to make a total that is more than the sum of its parts. But how is this represented in today's universities? Through cursory group work tasks, substandard teamwork courses, the courses that tend to get the lowest marks in all student satisfaction surveys. And that is in stark contrast to when you look at job satisfaction surveys from later in life where the major, if not primary reason given for high job satisfaction is being part of a great team. How are we preparing our people for today's society, for tomorrow's, for jobs that don't even yet exist? Curiosity and fun. I've worked with hundreds of academics around the world, and one thing characterizes the best of them, and it's this, they love their job. When you're in their presence, they talk about their subject, their eyes light up, their conversation goes on, and they're enthralling, gripping, gripped by their subject. Let me tell you a story. A couple of years ago, I gave a lunchtime research talk in three universities, two in the UK, one in the US. At the first one in the UK, I turned up, and the attendance was somewhat underwhelming. At the end of the talk, there was no time for discussion. The lecturers and researchers said that they had places to go, deadlines to meet, things that they had to get to. The second talk, well, interest was so low that actually the talk got canceled. I didn't even get to give it. And the third, in Harvard, in the US, the room was packed out. Every seat was taken. There were lecturers sitting on tables at the back, and there wasn't even a free lunch being served. At the end of the talk, discussion lingered long. Ideas were conversed. It was a wonderful experience. We need to take that culture of curiosity and fun from our very best universities and make it a feature of all of our universities. Be real. Life, universities, it's not all plain sailing. And yet, if you were to read the comments, the communications from both internal and external communications of senior management in universities, you would think that they never made a mistake. They never made a suboptimal decision. That always their strategy was implemented perfectly. Now, I'm a human, and I make mistakes every single day. And you're human too, and I suspect you do as well. And so do the senior managers of university. There's an incongruence between the communications we receive and the flawed humanity that we know exists. When you do have communication about failure, it is in the context of a crisis where the stakes are already high and the trust level is often too low. Far better to publish regular failure reports sharing how things have not gone as well as had been planned. What are the lessons being learned from that? It will build trust between the senior management and everyone else in the university community. But it will also demonstrate and encourage to students those skills of honesty, integrity, critical analysis, and challenge. Love. Not necessarily amorous or romantic love, but care, but well-being. 
If you ask most people, what's the most important thing to you? They will not say, it's the number in my bank account. They will not say, it's climbing the career ladder. People talk about the love that they exchange with their partner, with their parents, their children, their friends, the needy. This most central of human values should be central to our university as well. So, is your tutor your tutor or your champion? Are your tutees an irrelevance to the importance of your research? Or are they a privilege to motivate, to inspire, to create, to correct, and to develop? Well, these principles are all very well, but if that's all they are, nothing is going to change. Let's look at some practicalities, what can actually change, first for institutions and then for individuals. Recruit on attitude. Attitude being these principles I've been talking about, character. Recruitment is the most important thing that an institution does. We need to get it right. Great people can make a great success of an average plan, but a couple of bad people can totally screw up a great plan. And skills are much, much easier to teach than attitudinal character factors. So how about having some job interview questions that include, can you tell me a story of when you've been compassionate at work? Tell me the last time you championed your co-workers to your boss. Or who's the most junior member of your department? What are the names of their children? Let teachers teach and let researchers research. Universities have a habit of recruiting great researchers who love researching and who are great at it, and then giving them a huge teaching load, something that many of them don't want, and something that many of them are not necessarily very good at. Far better to raise the standard of higher education, teaching and learning as a profession in and of itself, and have the great researchers do great research. And yes, by all means, have them give one or two lectures, but not 20, not 30. It's not in their interest, but it's also not in a student's interest. And incentives, promotion and pay have to reflect this and back it up. Appropriate architecture. The layout of a room affects what you can do in it. It affects the atmosphere of the people in it. It's important. For example, McGill University in 2014 in Canada published a new set of guidelines for all of their learning spaces based on the feedback from a national student engagement survey. Thinking through things such as layout, furniture, uh, acoustics, lighting, color, and technology. Web 2.0 has been around now for more than 10 years, and yet it's still not ubiquitously used or even commonly used in the average university classroom. Some of these architectural things can be expensive, and I acknowledge that there's a time of not as much money as we used to have to spend on these things. But it doesn't have to be expensive. We can retrofit old buildings. I'll give you an example. In a large lecture theater like this, I sometimes use Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Ask the Audience style devices. They're great, they work well, but they've got a cost associated. We need to harness the power of technology that's in each of our pockets. What about a hashtag, a Twitter fall, a second projector? something that is much cheaper to do. But these physical things are nothing without the attitudes, the characters, the effort, and yes, the risk that goes alongside them. So that's the institutions. What about the individuals? What can you and I do today to make a difference in our university lives? I have five Ps to leave with you. And the first of this is purpose. The meaning of life, faith, entirely relevant things to inform your purpose, perhaps not in the scope of this talk. But you might want to ask yourself, what's my one sentence mission statement for my life? What defines success for me? I'll give you an example. I'm married, and one of the definitions of success for me is that I'm still married in 40 years' time. 42% of UK marriages currently end in divorce, and I don't want mine to be one of them. 
Mind you, 58% end in death. So <laughs> there you go. But a work life, a work, work life discrepancy is not going to help anyone. We need our goals and our purposes to mesh, particularly in universities where it's much more a vocation than a nine to five. And our purpose leads us on to priorities. And priorities is very simple. Spend your resources, your time, and your money on the things that are most important to you. But how are you doing at it? Here's an exercise uh, th that I find works really well. Keep a spreadsheet for two weeks of what you're doing every half hour of every day. And then look back on it. Are you spending your time how you think you're spending your time? And does that accord to your priorities? And you can do the same with, with three months of bank statements. If not, then change something. Passion. What makes you come alive? What is it that made you want to study and research the subject that you are doing? That will keep you going in those natural hard times where it's a bit of a struggle. In my working life, I have cleaned toilets, I have opened mail, I have scraped ashtrays. Some roles are harder to be passionate about than others. But passion can be a choice. We influence and choose our response to situations. What are you choosing today? People. Who makes you come alive? Who, when you're in their presence, gets you thinking, leaves you a better person than when you started? Who is your mentor, or could be? Who is journeying alongside you in this university walk? And who are you mentoring, whether you're a vice chancellor or a fresher? I suggest that these three relationships are mentor, peers, and mentees, mimicking that of a healthy family, coming back to being human, are something that can be important and integral to all of our working lives. Purpose, priorities, passion, people, and perseverance. Beware of anyone, including me, who tries to give you an easy answer to a difficult problem. If it was that easy, you would probably already have made the change. The best method I know for perseverance is that of accountability. So I have a challenge. If you identify one thing today that you want to change and a date by when you want to change it, Take 50 pounds, 50 euros, $100, however much is a lot. Give it to your friend and say, if I haven't achieved this by this date, you can take my money and just throw it away. It's a challenge. I've tried it many times across the world, and almost everyone has come back to me months later who took up that challenge and said, yes, I managed to achieve that change, even if I lost a bit of money along the way. In conclusion, Universities are fantastic places, staffed and attended by fantastic humans, people in research who go on to lead and change the world. But there's marked room for improvement. Can we do it? Of course we can. Humans are amazing. Will we do it? Well, I guess that's up to all of you. Act more human. Thank you for listening.